So what I'm actually going to focus on today is kind of um, really talk about some of, you know, some of the philosophy behind what this data perf project really is. And I just want you to know that, you know, I'm really representing the views of many people who have collaboratively, you know, worked together at ML Commons, which is a nonprofit that focuses on improving AI across models, data, infrastructure, and so forth. All right, with that said, one of the key words in the title is obviously benchmarks, right? It says benchmarks for data-centric AI development. So let me talk about what a benchmark is just to kind of level set. Because often when I talk about benchmark, it means two different things, depending on who you talk to. You talk to the systems community, it means one thing. You talk to the you know ML community, it means a different thing. And we have a very particular view on what a benchmark really is. So I just want to make sure you know we're all on the same page. The definition of a benchmark fundamentally is that it's a standard or a point of reference against which things are compared or assessed. Now, benchmarks are extremely, extremely key. Why? Because when for, first and foremost, they allow us to compare solutions. Now, why, why is it that comparing solutions is important? Well, it's because it allows us to really make informed selections. If we can compare apples and oranges, then we can actually understand which one we want, right? So being able to make informed selection decisions on systems or any kind of, you know, even data sets and so forth is sort of crucial. Um, and right now it's really hard to do that. And also benchmarks are key because they can actually help us measure forward progress that we're actually making in the community. You know, it's like if you have ImageNet, well, that's great. Then ImageNet, it becomes a bar by which we're systematically, you know, measuring progress year after year, right? And ultimately the goal is to advance the field. But to be able to have a good benchmark, especially when you're trying to drive the industry, which is kind of like the perspective that we come in from, it's not about just kind of building an academic benchmark and kind of putting it out there. Rather, what we're trying to do is build an industry-wide sort of a benchmark that can be widely adopted. But to do something like that, we really need to have good methodology, fundamental understanding of the problem space, and having a really rigorous methodology in terms of how we evaluate you know, apples versus oranges, for instance. And to do this, you really need community support and what we often like to call grudging consensus. You need to have a shared mindset about what the benchmark is. It's not about just going out and building one benchmark and throwing it overboard and saying, okay, everybody should use this because we say so. You really need to have um, you know, a community involvement. And if you can pull a benchmark like that based on community involvement, then you really standardize around a key set of use cases, one of the powerful concepts here would be that like we can actually agree what are some important tasks or use cases that the industry really cares about. And we can try and build workloads around that. And then it allows us to compare various kinds of systems. Now, you know, for example, here I say you can compare heterogeneous hardware and software systems if you have, you know, some sort of systems benchmark. If you have a data benchmark, you'll be able to compare data. And I'll talk a lot about that, obviously. It allows us to do complex characterization. I leveraged this slide from like system slides. So that's where it says system. Ultimately, the goal is you want verifiable and reproducible results, which we know specifically in the ML domain is kind of a little hard because there's a lot of nuances involved in terms of how we do things. So benchmarks is sort of like the bedrock of any community that is making you know, steadfast progress. And obviously in data-centric AI world, we're still in our really infancy. I almost feel like this work, work been done. We are trying to figure out how to walk, but we're often, you know, we're really in the crawling stages. If we take a look back on kind of how benchmarks have kind of really advanced the field and how they work, there are lots of different benchmarks. So I'm going to pick some examples to talk about here. Let's say, for example, you have a process or a system, right? System Systems people are very used to building benchmarks, um, you know. And so if you look at a general purpose processor, the one that's sitting in your laptop, your workstation, wherever you're dialed in for this meeting from, right? You tend to have benchmarks like what we call a spec programs, right? These are applications, vanilla applications, totally got nothing to do with ML, just a core set of good workloads. And what you're trying to understand is like, you know, how well the underlying microarchitecture, the hardware design, for instance, is actually doing. So to do that, what do we do? We often take some piece of code, right? Let me see if I can get my pointer on. That's, we often tend to have some piece of code and we take that piece of code and we lock that piece of code and this is application A or application B and so forth with whatever the binary is. Then we tend to lock in the compilers, you know, the things that actually generate the machine instructions for a given application. We tend to lock in the compiler settings and so forth. And then once those are frozen, then we actually run it on the underlying hardware where we tend to do a lot of optimization. And that allows us to understand, hey, how well is a processor actually doing compared to an old processor, for instance, right? 
Now, this is, you know, the spec CPU benchmark is sort of the bedrock of building general purpose processors, for instance. Now, obviously, you know, in the last decade, ML has become key. So if you look at ML perf, which is, you know, something that I also help contribute to developing, you know, what do we tend to do there? Like, you know, we want to measure an ML systems performance, right? So what means you want to measure the underlying infrastructure capabilities? What do we do for that? Well, we obviously have good data sets out there, well, at least enough to kind of, you know, start making headway in measurements. So we tend to freeze the data set, right? We say, okay, well, let's use ImageNet, let's use MS Coco, let's use, you know, some kitty data set, something like that, right? We tend to freeze. Um, and then in, in ML Perf, because we're really interested in the system performance, we also freeze the model. So you might say, okay, I'm going to take ResNet, or I'm going to take, you know, transformer architecture, I'm going to take some sort of, you know, RL-based algorithm. So you kind of choose that and you freeze those two, and then you run it on the underlying ML system. That allows you to effectively understand what the capabilities of the infra are. Now, the infra here is both, you know, the hardware, the software, and so forth. Now, these, these sorts of understanding, locking certain portions in, right, and then allowing other subsystems to optimize, it sort of like really enables us to systematically understand whether something is working better or not. Just to kind of show you just how important benchmarking in, a, in this sort of standard way is important is like, you know, I'm showing you data about, you know, for ML perf training, it's a suite of workloads and we're looking at some systems and, you know, over some recent years, right? We're looking at improvements that we are seeing relative to when the first benchmark came out. This is all in the systems context for, you know, a set of different networks that are sort of, you know, reference uh, networks that continue to stay. And what we see here is that because we have good metrics and we have good proper benchmarks that is driven by community input, which is what ML Perf is, right? um, then we have been able to make massive strides and improvement in terms of performance, right? So we're able to, given a baseline, able to make improvements. Now, this is how the modeling side, we did this on the algorithm side where we locked the data set and then we pushed the algorithm innovation in ML with ImageNet and so forth. In the ML system side, we have done this by locking the models and locking the data sets and really pushing the infrastructure to actually be so with these examples, the point that I'm trying to make is that benchmarks fundamentally in the community are key because they drive progress and they allow a lot of transparency. I've talked a lot about the progress aspects, right? Because whatever you measure is undoubtedly going to get better if we, are, if we care about the problem space. At the same time, what's also really important beyond just saying that, okay, this number is better than this number and so forth. What we actually want is also transparency. We want to be able to systematically understand what is leading to the advancements. And that is key because if we don't have transparency, then we don't understand how to improve the field collectively. So long story short, benchmarking really aligns the community with a clear and single objective, right? They're extremely key. And because they're extremely key, it's important to get them right. And this is where the community aspect that I was talking about really kind of comes into full gear. Now, typically when you're looking at any ML space, you know, ML is a really rich and heterogeneous space, right? You have um, very complex scale problems. You're often, when you're training systems, you've got massive scale that you're looking at. You're obviously running a lot of different kinds of software, uh, software libraries and so forth that will allow you to get that performance. You're using various kinds of algorithms inside to be able to, you know, really get the models to learn. You've got rich architecture, you know, lots of TPUs, GPUs, all these kinds of hardware. And of course, you've got really innovative aspects that are going on in Silicon. All of this is sort of really the system side of the world. And so whenever when people talk about ML performance in the wild, like, you know, often we tend to really just talk about this side of the world is what I would say, especially from benchmarks, I would say even more so in this. But the elephant in the room is often the data, right? As we all know, like, obviously, this is from a data center community that understands the data. So obviously, data is the key thing. Now, if you were to compare data to the way we understand how systems scale, how software you know, is this software package better than the other software package? Yeah, you can actually measure those things. Is one algorithm better than the other algorithm? Yes, we know how to kind of evaluate that. Same for architecture, same for the lowest levels of the silicon itself. Like we know how to systematically look at it. But arguably, when you look at data, it's really hard to say, is data set A, for instance, better than data set B? What, like, what does that even mean, right? That's because I feel like we haven't quite systematized our understanding of how to look at data. We understand the broad problems of, you know, what the 
out of distribution issues will be, you know, what the characteristics of the data need to be and so forth. We understand those things, but we cannot really sit down and say, hey, let's do a data review. The way we talk about code reviews, imagine you go into a room, like with my students, for instance, if I go in and I say, I want to do a code review, I know exactly what I'm expecting to see, and I know how to review the code. But imagine if someone, you had to sit down and say, okay, let's do a data set review. What does that even mean, right? And I think that's the problem. We're not quite at a place where we, we know the value of data, but we don't unfortunately have the mechanisms to sort of systematically understand what the data is. And the general problem, right, if we kind of look at what the community is going through, the problem really comes from the fact that we tend to over-invest in the neural network model development. Like this is just kind of looking at, you know, the New York's publications up until 2021. And obviously, you know, if you look at it, AAAI and so forth, like, the number of modeling papers are just insane, right? And so the point is, as a community, like we have been investing billions of dollars through, you know, tech industry, as well as, you know, this uh, academic scientific research that's happening. And it's often like we lock the data in and then we really try and innovate and push the modeling aspects and we do a good job of that, right? So the question then is like, you know, you know, is that enough, right? This underinvestment in data, is this problematic? Well, I think the, the Tacoma Norris Bridge is sort of a classic example, right? Which was a catastrophic failure for bridge, even though we had really good understanding of how to build bridges, quote unquote, like building data sets. We know how to quote, put data sets together. There are lots of data sets that we put together. What we really don't quite understand is that with the testing conditions by which we need to really evaluate. Someone, you know, at some point comes up with a test set and we say, okay, well, that's the test set that comes with the data set. Then that's what we're really going to binge on, right? But we don't really take a hard look at like, how should we construct the test set? How should we really be crafting the training set and so forth? We don't systematically look at that. And the Tacoma Bridge, effectively, the reason you have this collapse is because it was designed for a certain set of conditions, but really the critical test data that they needed to have to test the way the you know wind was gonna flow through this bridge was not something that they actually captured. In other words, their test data set, quote unquote, was actually totally a mismark on this point. So this can actually have catastrophic failures in the real world. Why? If you read this wonderful paper, right? Everyone wants to do the model work, not the data work, aka the data cascades and high stakes AI. It's obvious that we know that, you know, from the beginning of, you know, the ML statement, you know, that you can have massive downstream data cascades because if you're not careful about the way we structure the data and you don't have a strong understanding of the data, then all the effort you put into the modeling and so forth is a fundamental waste of time, right? So not only do we tend to have like massive catastrophic failures because we don't really understand the data and then we put it out in the wild. And yes, we do ML ops and we do ML monitoring of the models. We try and look for data drifts and all that. But that's all really a costly sort of an affair to kind of think about all that downstream, right? We really do need to systematically understand the qualities of the data ahead of time. And also, so that's one problem that we have with the aspect of like, you know, just not having good grips on the data. The other aspect that we really have an issue with is that models are nowadays starting to saturate, right? Um, the data sets are fundamentally not complicated enough. Um, so in many cases, we're actually seeing models actually surpassing, you know, quote, unquote, um, the human expected behavior and actually doing so in a very, very um, short time frame, right? Like if you look at Squad, for instance, you know, very quickly it was saturated. Um, this is not to say that, that you know, people are, who are building the data sets are doing a poor job. It's just that it's a hard problem and we need to build an engine for how we actually think about data. Um, often we tend to build these unique, you know, let's say we build a data set and then we kind of put it out and people work on the models and so forth. And yes, that's that's good. But then it's like the data set kind of becomes like a static kind of a version, right? But data is really live. So when we are actually thinking about benchmarking systems, what we should be doing is really thinking about the fact that these data sets are like dynamic and constantly changing. So how do we incorporate that vision into how we are sure, how we also benchmark uh, the data set so that, that you know, models don't effectively saturate. You all know about Kaggle, right? Kaggle is great because it allows us to benchmark models, for instance, right? What do we do? We have some base infrastructure, then we often lock the data in because we have some data set, right? And then we optimize the models, the heck out of them, right? And then we show that it's awesome. The vision that I'm, we're all trying to get to is effectively, how can we turn something like that for, imagine like doing things for data. You actually want to measure systematic progress and is the data quality actually getting better? 
So in other words, we have to take some ML infrastructure. We want to freeze that. We want to ignore the model, effectively flip it the other way, right? We want to lock the model in and then actually push the data set. So for a given fixed architecture with its capacity and so forth, how can you really shrink the data? Now, when you think of this kind of a problem, there's a really interesting way to look at the data. There's an aspect of, okay, what's the quality of the data, right? And you can say, okay, I'm trying to improve the accuracy of models by improving the data quality. That's one way to look at it. But often one of the key things that people miss out is that when you look at the training times for some of these models, right? It often tends to be a fairly substantial amount. Now you can actually take a data problem and convert that into a systems optimization opportunity. Why? Because if I can shrink the data down, right? Then I can effectively get the model to train faster. However, the key question is, well, is my model still able to, you know, have whatever accuracy that it's supposed to have? So that's the basic vision of what we're trying to do is to like, how do we benchmark data? That's a question. So there's lots of really good work going on out there in the field. And this slide is not meant to be very comprehensive, but I'm going to talk about like what we did in order to try and bootstrap this uh, solution for answering the question of how do we improve data? So there are existing benchmarks like cats for ml that specifically deals with adversarial sort of, you know, efforts where you're trying to find the needle in the haystack where the model's going to crap out, right? There are systems like Dynabench, which was originally been for like hate speech from Meta, um, which now is kind of part of ML Commons. And, you know, Dynabench is a platform that allows you to kind of do these things. In a way, you could say it's arguably somewhat similar to like Kaggle and so forth. Then, of course, Andrew... Uh, Andrew Ng ran the first data-centric AI competition, which we also like, you know, worked with. Um, and the intent there was to kind of get all of us to kind of systematically think about, okay, what does it mean to lock a model and think about the data, right? And of course, you know, there are other efforts in here, like, you know, the efforts from uh, Zurich and so forth, like on DC Bench and Stanford. Um, then there's, of course, you know, that's all the, the benchmark you know, the problem statement of how to look at the data. But then, of course, there's all platforms and organizations, right? So Dynavench is yet another platform. Of course, it also has a hate speech and, and a, some other sentiment analysis and so forth. But it's also a platform to run some of these challenges that you want. Then, of course, as I alluded to, MLPerf, something we built, was really focused on building infrastructure for um, for systematically benchmarking system performance. But we have a lot of knowledge about how to bring the community together which then later matured into ML Commons, you know, uh, which is what I'm here talking about. ML Commons is the nonprofit that actually supports all of these kinds of innovations. And of course, NeurIPS, you know, we work with the NeurIPS folks because they have the benchmarks and data sets track. And of course, we, you know, try to keep up this whole data-centric AI sort of collection. And it's so awesome that you folks did the same thing. We coincidentally discovered you folks. Um, Long story short, the point is we're all, you know, we as a community, you know, from different groups need to come together and to focus on really data, right? Obviously, now when you want to benchmark data, it goes into this question of what do you really want to benchmark? Well, obviously, you can benchmark the training data that we have, the test data, which is the ultimate gatekeeper as to whether these models are good or not. So the test data becomes extremely key, right? For example, if I'm building a smart security camera, just hypothetically, then if my test data is really not built for the actual deployment scenario, then, you know, if, even if I get a good accuracy in, in this leaderboards or whatnot, what good does it do? So how do we systematically think about that notion of what is good test data? And of course, that those are just the data sets, right? But often the key thing is that there are algorithms involved in this. Now, data is increasingly becoming, you know, larger and larger, right? People are just trying to suck in all the data we can. So what that means is that even though we understand that data quality is the key thing, we're getting larger data sets that often tend to be noisy, but I think that's okay. The way I think we should think about it is that, you know, let's go back to, for example, if you take Google as a company, like the thing that I admire about the company is that they built this massive planetary scale computing infrastructure in order to index the World Wide Web. When they did that, they did not say, hey, we index the World Wide Web. Here's a snapshot. That's not what they stopped, right? The way the infrastructure works is that it's continuously evolving, quote unquote, the data set for the World Wide Web. And out of that, you issue a query. And of course, they have their fancy page rank algorithms and all machine learning algorithms that are going out and actually finding that needle in a haystack, effectively synthesizing whatever data set that we really need based on the question that we have of interest. Point is, you know, we tend to go out, scour all of that 
internet content, bring it together. And it's a noisy, noisy data set. But out of that, we we layer that then with algorithms that will allow us to find those interesting tidbits. And that's how we build these complex systems that are serving us today. So in a similar way, like we should be really thinking about how do we think of algorithms, you know, in this kind of context, how do we promote algorithmic innovation in cleaning data, for instance? So it's not about just building good training data set or building a good test litmus set data set, or, you know, it's also about the algorithms. So, and that's really the essence of what data perf is. And now I'm going to like, hope oh, my intent so far has been to like really kind of just motivate the notion of why we want to think about data. Now, what I'm going to do is actually try and get more specific and talk about exactly what our group is kind of like, you know, all doing in the data perf kind of context. In fact, I just came from the data perf working group meeting. So if you look at a data pipeline at large, right, as much as we focus on training data, test data, and so forth, then we often just focus, you know, we jump ahead. Once we create the training and test data, we usually jump ahead and say, okay, I'm going to train the model. I'm going to explore all these interesting things about the data, uh, about the model, and then just focus on really model-centric operations that we want to have, right? However, when we look at any data set that is actually coming out, in reality, there's a whole set of data-centric operations we want to perform on it, right? Much like the way we kind of go over, you know, architecture searches and so forth for the models, we want to understand what are the qualitative sort of like key components of the data pipeline. In an ideal world, what we want to do is we want to capture the end-to-end -end data pipeline. Then we want to benchmark each of those individual stages of that data pipeline which are all these data-centric operations, right? And we want to improve those sets of, you know, how these algorithms or, you know, the data sets that actually come out of as a result of these things. And so one is crafting this, you know, end-to-end -end pipeline and then figuring out how to benchmark each of those pieces. So that might mean, you know, first you do data parsing, then you might have to augment the data, then you have some sort of intelligent representation selection for the task you're trying to get at, then, assess what the quality of the data is, is it good, you know, go ahead and clean it and so forth, right? So there are many, many steps. This is not meant to be comprehensive, but it's intended to give you the vision of what we are. Once we do that, we actually end up with a training data from whatever the original raw data might have been. And so the question is, given that the this training data set is going to be so crucial for the model, can we lock the model down here and effectively evaluate, you know, these kinds of individual stages, right? So, the whole notion of data perf is to promote the data centric sort of a methodology. And ideally, what we want to do is that obviously we have to still continue evaluating model capabilities because it is also important. But we know how to do that over, you know, over the past decade, you know, the community has largely figured out how to do that well, and we will continue to do that. But the key thing is that we want to now flip our interest to kind of looking at not also measuring the training and test data. Specifically in the data perf thing, what we're doing is we lock the model in and we try and develop methods for training and uh, test data thing. In other words, what are some creative ways of improving the training data just to create a training data set? What are some interesting ways to create the improved test data set? Um, and are there specific ways that we should improve certain parts of the data, right? So training data. So for example, if you're looking into improving the training data, obviously we want to allow agility in here, but then we want to, we're going to have to lock the model, and we're going to have to lock the test data set. And then we have methods of improving this. And I'll talk a bit more as I go through later. Similarly, if we want to improve the test data set, we want to lock the training data, and then we want to lock the model, and then allow these things to be pushed further. <clears throat> now, when you're talking about improving the training or the test data set, right? Um, there's creating these artifacts, there's the algorithms. And when you talk about the algorithms, to go one level deeper, you can actually have, you know, slices of data that are actually important, right? Slices typically are referring to, you know, some of the weak points within the data sets, right? And so you don't necessarily need to improve the whole data. You identify where your models are not performing well, and you want to identify that slice, and then you want to specifically focus on that. The next one could be for, you know, about data valuation, which is like, you know, um, as data is coming in, let's say, you know, you have two different data sets. Let's say in an enterprise setting, you know, people come to you and say, hey, you know, I've got two different data sets. Like, um, sorry, I have a data set to offer to you, and I already have a data set. Let's assume that, right? So then how do I determine if I should be paying a certain amount of value for this data, right? Like, I don't know what's inside the data. You're not going to give me your data because that is the value add or that is your IP. And so how do we sort of systematically understand what's the real value of that data so that I know whether to pull that data in so that I'll actually know 
that, oh, if I do pull that data in, it is in fact going to drive up my models, you know, performance. And also like, you know, where their bound data is never perfect, right? So we have to have some sort of automated ways of debugging, you know, this data pipeline. Um, and of course, identifying smaller selections, right? So in other words, like imagine I have a very large training set and what I really want to do is I want to identify the key subs of the core sets that I actually want to get. So how do we sort of, you know, push that? All of these concepts and what I'm saying are not necessarily brand new to the community, but what I think we, the scientific community has been doing a good job of just kind of scratching and, you know, thinking about these things. What we're trying to do is to kind of build this continuous engine where we effectively have, you know, a set of different types of tasks that we want to do or like benchmarks that we want to solve, right? So for example, we want to have a benchmark for training and test set creation itself, just creating from scratch. We might, the second one might be, okay, I have a very noisy or very large sort of a training or test set pool, and I want to just do sub-selection from that, right? Or as I alluded to, I want to do data valuation. How can I tell if data is, you know, one data is better than another? Data debugging, if there are bugs in, quote, unquote, the data. And data slicing is unfair. So you can imagine, like, in data part of what we're envisioning is, like, we have a whole bunch of these different kinds of benchmarks. We are right now starting with a few, which I will explain in greater detail, uh, but right now I'm trying to show you what specific types of benchmarks we want to build. And then, of course, you layer that with a set of tasks, right? So you might say, okay, if I want to be able to do these kinds of tasks, like set, training test set selection or creation. I want to do that maybe for NLP. I want to do that maybe for some sort of like, you know, speech recognition and so forth. So you could have a whole laundry list of these different types of tasks. And then this cross product of what benchmark kind of thing, what you want to benchmark and what tasks are you going to actually look at? That effectively is what data perf is all about. Data perf is creating, is all about creating this matrix. And the way we're trying to do this is by bringing together many different people um, as a collection. So now let me kind of get into some of the mechanics of how data perf kind of works at a high level. And I'll give you examples of the challenges that we're actually about to, you know, put out. Um, and then we can go from there. So, this diagram should largely look familiar because we're interested in like, you know, these data centric sort of operations or, you know, data centric uh, iterations that we want to do. So we have some sort of training data, test data, you know, whatever data source you have, right? And the question is what happens here? As I alluded to, you have a whole bunch of different things you can be doing in the space, but let's just take, for example, like data set, data, data selection or data cleaning that you want to do. So this means you have some training data, you want to create a nice clean training data set. That's the goal, very simple, right? Input do some process on the data, spit out an output. And then that's the core functionality. So how would one participate in the data perf challenges, for instance? Um, first and foremost, you know, these challenges are kind of something that we're baking. There are different organizations working on building these challenges. Hopefully folks from here would be interested in either participating in those challenges or helping build the next set of, you know, interesting challenges that we should be doing. So these, um, the resources are all effectively packaged um, on ML Commons. And then you would effectively get that thing and then you would actually develop your solution locally. So you'll come up with some sort of algorithms that, you know, that you think are really good and then you evaluate them and you say, okay, yeah, my training data is really better. So you iterate locally in your side and then you would submit whatever sort of, um, you know, test data or not like up into Dynabench platform, which I alluded to is sort of an infrastructure that allows us to actually run some of these um, challenges. And then ultimately we intend to create leaderboards, right? Now, this is the general vision, obviously, for any challenge that's going to sit inside the data-centric sort of a paradigm for benchmarking. Um, and this is what we have now. That's not to say this is exactly what we will be, you know, doing in multiple iterations. Like, this is where we are starting on right now. So let me kind of fill in on one, you know, two challenges, two or three challenges, um, rather than cover the full gamut of what we're going after. As I said, you know, it's a community-driven effort. So, you know, Will and Cody, who are from Coactive, they're um, co-founders of this company called Coactive, which works on vision data. And uh, it's a startup. And it's, as a startup, they're innovating this space too. They are trying to build algorithms and support. So one of the challenges that, um, that they're pulling out of, um, you know, some of Cody's PhD work back then was like uh, designing a data selection strategy that chooses the best training algorithm from a large pool of training images that you actually have, right? Um, so the intent is that you have a large pool of different resources, you know, that becomes your input, and then you have some sort of evaluation methodology that you're actually going to iterate locally, and then you kind of score that at the end, right? And this is obviously just focused on image classification. 
And, you know, what we do is like in order to build these, you know, the, the data sets and so forth, we provide the resources, as I was saying earlier, you know, we have some subset of the open images data set that we're actually using as an input uh, data set. Like that's a, that's an idea of like, you know, what a vision benchmark would look like, right? And ultimately, you know, when things are scored, you end up on the leaderboard and that helps you understand. Like, so the contribution that really comes out here is going to be the training data set selection algorithm. How does it work? Now, the intent here is what we are really looking for is to end up with algorithms that are so straight at the art. In an ideal world, we, we should, as a community, have these algorithms all out in the open source, right? Someone comes up with a you know, solution. It's not just about the score, right? The score is just a means to kind of help us identify, hey, who's able to do this really well on a shared sort of mindset? And hopefully those algorithms will be open source. So that way it's like people are able to adopt them and, you know, go ahead and do exactly what we've done with the open source revolution for code, right? People sharing stuff, people all contributing a little bit, little bit by little bit, everybody improves. And collectively, we all benefit so much because everybody's little bit of time translates to a massive impact in the field. <clears throat> and of course, one of the interesting questions that often comes up when I talk about this is that, hey, well, it's like, you know, let's say I'm a startup and yes, I have some intelligent, you know, cleaning methods, but that is my IP. I'm not just going to give you my algorithms, right? And that's fine. It's like, you know, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, that be open source. If that is sort of like, you know, your, your sauce and that's your, you know, that's what makes your money. That's totally fine from our perspective, but the intent is that it's got to be some something that's actually accessible to people so that people can be like, oh, this actually works well. And I know where to go get that, you know, training data set selection algorithm. So that's on the vision side, right? So similarly, we have something for speech that we are doing. Um, this is actually being done by my students who lay, lead a lot of the effort. Uh, so the kudos is really goes to them. And, you know, in this particular case, you know, they're looking at speech. It's not like full on ASR kind of related stuff. It's more about just keyword spotting as a specific aspect of speech. And the data set that uh, they're using is an inherently a noisy data set, but it's a massive keyword data set uh, which supports something like 50 languages. Um, yeah, 50 languages effectively. Um, and it's got a real rich distribution of different kinds of keywords that are in there because they're all automatically sourced. However, because they are automatically, you know, it's like, think of it as like, you know, we built this machinery that allows us to go and get these massive number of keywords, you know, identify all these keywords that we can identify by doing um, uh, force alignment and then automatically chopping things up. So you have a lot of different keywords. But when you do that by, you know, sort of like going and searching the online materials that you can actually legally access, you end up with noisy data too. That's a bit of a problem. So then what you really want to do in such a situation is great. I've got this noisy, but incredibly large data. So there is really good data in there. Then you want to identify the keywords in those, in that corpus uh, to be able to identify what's like, you know, good training data, right? So again, same thing. You have some sort of input, you perform some sort of selection algorithms that you're going to write, right? And then we train a model and, and then eva evaluate the model and see how well your selection algorithms are actually doing on this large data set, right? And in this particular case, you know, uh, Mark and Kobe structured it so that the challenges run not in a single language, it's actually run in multi, multi, multiple languages because obviously they're using a multilingual data set. So that's a really interesting thing. Then there's another one that's also on vision. However, this time it's on cleaning the data. So if you look at these two, for instance, there's selection, right? They, they focus on selection, training data selection, but in this case, it is on speech and vision. Now we go back to vision, but we're really focusing on cleaning up the noisy labels and so forth. So the goal here is we want to design a cleaning strategy that chooses samples to relabel from a noisy training set. Again, the fundamental assumption is that you, your original training sets tend to be noisy and you want to get something better. And as you can see, the evaluation says that the submissions are scored on the minimum number of clean samples required to achieve an accuracy, a certain accuracy threshold on image classification. Right. So again, like, you know, the golden thing here is to like actually have a small, small, nice, clean data set. And so this way you can kind of create this decoupling of building large corpuses of information and then actually finding that needle in a haystack kind of a thing where you have algorithms that are able to prune through. Now, there are other, you know, I've just kind of mentioned, you know, two in vision, but different tasks. And I mentioned speech. There's another one that's called data valuation that we're actually working on. Um, there's yet another one that's focused specifically on adversarial tasks that we're working on. So there are other challenges that are already sort of pipeline. So these first three are kind of coming out because, you know, that's where we built the consensus. There's a lot of effort in building that shared mindset of, okay, what are we trying to do here? Mm -hmm. And um, 
you know, all of these challenges will be on the ML Commons sort of website, you know, under the Dynabench platform. And you can see down here, obviously, there are other challenges. But specifically, the ones that we're focusing on data quality and so forth are really in the bottom row, right? So there's the vision data perf, the debugging data perf, the speech data perf, and so forth. Um, and a couple other ones that are in the works right now. So the intent is that one would actually be able to go online, very much like Kaggle and so forth, and be able to make submissions for their algorithms or upload their, you know, test data set and so forth. And that's effectively what Dataperf really is, right? It's trying to build this community-driven sort of a methodology. And our intent is not to kind of come up with these benchmarks that I've shown you and said, okay, those are the only ones. We have a very iterative sort of a mindset because what we want to do is we want to put a benchmark out and then we want to get the community to kind of do what, you know, was done in the data center AI competition and then continue iterating on this. Uh, and Andrew's actually also one of our, you know, one of the uh, contributors to this kind of vision of how do we build this collectively. And our vision for doing this is not about just coming up with yet another algorithm. What we really have in mind is one, building this sort of benchmark so we can systematize the understanding of data, then doing that across multiple stages of the data pipeline, which I showed you earlier. Why? Because we have this vision of what we call as a data ratchet. The idea is that once you improve a training data set, then we can use the training data set to sort of you know, push the test data sets. Then once you improve the test data set, then you can use the test data sets to drive the training data set. So it's kind of like this ratchet notion. It's like one thing at a time, right? And that's what we're trying to build at the Dataperf community. Um, so I encourage you to go check out dataperf.org. You can see the white paper that we have that we put out a while back. And we're actually, we were just talking in fact about improving the, uh, the white paper based on a lot of feedback and so forth that we've gotten since we initially kind of released it. But I encourage you to check it out. More importantly, I encourage you to kind of take part in the, in the working groups that we have because we're collectively trying to build this as a community-driven project, right? So Dataperf's goals are really kind of these core things. One is we want to focus on the research and development on improving data quality, right? Then we want to improve the training data set so we can actually improve, you know, increase the accuracy, right? We also want to reduce the amount of data required to train. And this is important because as our models are getting really large, that means, you know, our training times also exceed us, right? Like, so, what, you know, you could think of like, if I can shrink the data through some sort of clever selection algorithm, then it still gets me the same accuracy. Then I can actually think of that as a systems optimization because now it takes me less time to actually do the training, which is actually a really good thing. So you, you get a double fold, you get better data, and you're actually improving. Uh, it costs us le less to train the large models. And of course, you also want to improve the test data sets. And you know, effectively, we want to have good, solid test data sets out there. I think like we don't have enough good, high quality test data sets. And I think even if we just build good test data sets as a result of this, I think that in itself, personally for me, is a big win. And of course, once you have this sort of a methodology, then naturally, you know, we will start to be able to decrease bias and increase representation and so forth. It's bound to happen because we're suddenly got the the, the bells and whistles to improve the data quality. Um, of course, we want to drive better techniques and start building tools, like going back to that original point that I was making. Imagine sitting down someday in a room and doing a data review, right? With well-established tools. Like what if I wanted to do a diff on a data set, right? Imagine that. You do a code review and you do a diff and you know exactly how to look at it. Everybody across the planet knows how that works, right? It's a common language through code. Imagine if we could build a diff tool for data sets. You could say, yeah, yeah, I can just diff all the differences. Yeah, that's not a real diff, right? Something that's actually intelligent where we can actually, a tool that can actually allow us to fix problems is actually a tool that does something of value for us. So imagine trying to build a data diff kind of a tool. Wouldn't that be kind of cool? And I think like those kinds of things will naturally come out as we systematize this pipeline of uh, the data flow that we have. And we want to have consistent metrics so that researchers and developers across the community, everybody can actually say, hey, yeah, Okay, I have a selection algorithm. You have a selection algorithm. Both of our algorithms, when compared on these core metrics, they make sense. So then I can actually evaluate which algorithm I should go with, given a certain premium for a cost or something. And of course, naturally, you know, we want to enforce replicability, which is fundamental to building benchmarks, right? Ultimately, we want to keep benchmarking in this space uh, around data um, actually accessible to everybody, right? Um, so that's sort of like the, the big vision around data perf. Um, and again, I'm really here to, you know, answer questions, but and reflect what the community collectively thinks about 
um, in the spaces we are working together. And I encourage you to join the working group or, you know, just bring your ideas and say, hey, well, you know, I'd like to contribute this challenge. Um, and we have the necessary resources and infrastructure. And, you know, it would be a challenge that um, if you think it's important, that might be important for the community. Um, sorry, I said uh, 2022 down here, but it's really, uh, we're actually just about to kind of make a big splash about this publicly. We had mentioned the, the white paper and so forth for a while, but we've actually been building a massive amount of infrastructure behind the scenes to, you know, really get this going because our intent is to kind of have this go on as a smooth engine um, repeatedly. Um, with that said, that's all I got for you folks, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have.